You can see my screen, right? You looking at my presentation? Okay, good. All right, all right, we're gonna start. So everybody's muted, that's good. I'm sure more people are gonna join. Um, so welcome to this, our sixth virtual meeting, right? We've had a one or two every month since COVID started. Hopefully one day we're gonna go back to the live meetings. But uh, for now, we are stuck at home. So just today's agenda. Uh, just the first five minutes is an introduction. Right, the next five minutes are just the state of the current uh, New York real estate, what's going on, what I see in my area. Uh, then we're going to have a presentation from uh, Stephen Moskowitz of RD Advisors. He's a hard money lender that's actually just starting to lend in New York now. Um, and they have some interesting uh, uh, aspects to their products. And the last five minutes will be just uh, going over how I can help you. And then we'll have questions and answers anybody can ask. We'll stay till, I'll stay till 5.30, but usually we're done before that. Okay. So first, who am I? For those of you not familiar, my name is Michael Pinter. I bought my first house in Long Island in 1996. I've been a full-time real estate investor, basically flipping and wholesaling in Long Island, New York since 2013. Right, before that, I was 17 years in the real estate finance uh, world. I worked for the same mortgage company for 17 years. Um, the first four years I started doing this, I was buying at auctions, mostly live auctions, and Nassau County auction on Tuesdays. And I re got rehabbed every property. I wanted to be Tarek El Musa from Flip or Flop. Uh, and uh, I just thought that that was the greatest thing ever. Um, after about four years of dealing with a lot of rehabbing and realizing that it was very hard to scale the business buying at auctions, I started marketing direct to sellers. So for four and a half years now, I've been marketing direct to sellers and then um, either rehabbing, wholesaling the property or wholesaling, which just to talk about it, wholesaling is when uh, I get into contract and then I assign the contract to somebody else who's usually going to rehab it. Uh, whole rehabbing is obviously when you take the property and do massive, you know, a work to it and increase the value. And wholesaling is when I buy a property, uh, close on it, and I do minimal work to it. Um, I'd say under ten thousand dollars worth of work to it, and then put it out retail quickly. Um, so that's what I've been doing for four years. And now I have some control over how many deals I get because I can uh, see which marketing channels work and I can just uh, spend more money on marketing to get more deals. My office is in Hewlett. Please come by to see it. We had three visitors last week. Um, I operate in Nassau and Suffolk. I try not to go all the way out east, although sometimes I find myself doing it. I prefer Nassau, but I do Suffolk too. Um, last year I did a, uh, about 45 deals. Half of them were uh, wholesale where I just uh, assigned the contract and the other half I closed either hotel them or rehab them. So this RIA, this Nassau County RIA has been around for a little over a year. We started in June of 2019. It's been a great year. Until COVID, we had uh, one live meeting every month in Valley Stream, and then we'd have another meeting at a property that I was doing. Um, since we started, we've had over 60 RIA members have come to the office. Uh, everybody's invited to come in. You can see the board and properties we're working on. Um, Several RIA members have brought deals to me that I co wholesale with them. So uh, they got they got a, a split of the profits. Several members have bought wholesale deals for me. Uh, one of them is here, Ed. He recently bought a wholesale deal for me and wholesaled it and made uh, $30,000. Uh, several members have borrowed from me on the flips. I do lend on a rare occasion. Um, and now we're going to talk about what's going on in the current real estate market. So again, I don't want to talk about this being as a good thing and opportunistic, but because this is a bad situation, right? People are dying. A lot of people have died. Uh, I think we're, I just saw a video of a, a, do, a very well-respected doctor I know who has two patients that tested positive for COVID, tested negative, and now tested positive again. So uh, I think people who had the, the, in fact, one of his patients, he said, tested so high on the titers for antibodies that they donated plasma several times. So, you know, I was upset that I didn't have antibodies. I thought if you get this, you don't get it again, but it looks like you can get it again. Um, New York is really in the center of it. We went through... Uh, the toughest part of it the other parts of the country are going through that now if people get reinfected in new york it's going to be a mess too but regardless it's going to become a very good opportunity in the real estate market soon um for me i had a worthless march and april really nothing i couldn't market for new deals i couldn't i had 10 uh, 10 deals in contract before covid i couldn't sell any of them in march and april um finally in may i started selling them and now business has picked up june is, was really good two weeks ago i had the best week i've ever had in the business 10 transactions in one week uh three new contracts for deals i'm buying two wholesale assignments i count that as two and three sales of properties that i own i usually do seven to eight transactions per month 
So that was a great week. And now I'm still getting deals. I started, uh, I started marketing again and people have been much more receptive than they were in March and April where they were not so receptive and they were telling me like, you're out of your mind, you know what's going on here. Um, so in general, I never make predictions, but I've never been as sure as anything that something's going to happen in the New York real estate market soon. I think it's going, I can't believe I spelled the wrong. Um, the most of the country, I think, uh, the real estate market, I think it's going to go down. I don't know how long it's going to go down for. I don't know how much it's going to go down, but I think it's got to go down. And I believe that there's going to be more money made in the real estate market over the next nine to 24 months than ever before. Uh, I know a lot of people who did very well in 2009 and 2010 because they saw what was going on, prices dropped, they bought a lot of properties. And I think that's the kind of situation we're going to be in where there's going to be a lot of people who need to sell. So why am I so sure that the market's going to go down? I believe the market desperately needed a correction even before COVID, right? We were 12 years into an up cycle. The bottom in New York was really 2008. Um, there's huge numbers of jobs that are gone, not coming back. There's 40 million people unemployed in the last 12 weeks. I think the economy is going to be bad for a while. And many people now are still collecting unemployment. Some are making more money on unemployment than they were making while they were working. And a lot of people are getting paid because of PPP loans. I had people that weren't doing anything for me in March and April, but I paid them because for me to get my PPP loan forgiven, I had to pay them. So this all ends in August. The, all this stuff is gonna is gonna end. PPP is gonna end. I mean, there might be another stimulus uh, product, but it's only a temporary mandate. The economy is gonna do poorly, and I think real estate will reflect that at some point. Again, I don't know how deep, how much it's gonna go down. I don't know how long it's gonna go down for, but I think it's going down. I think it's gonna be great for people that buy distressed properties like me. So we're gonna see things in the. Uh, these are very recent articles, right? This is all July, right? Real estate prices fall sharply. That was the Times on July 2nd. It's talking about how things are getting bad. Forbes July 1st, that this was a period like no other. Contracts were down 68%. These are all the things that haven't really, people don't see it yet, uh, but it's all coming. CNBC on July 1st, the sale, New York apartment sales were the worst on record, biggest plunge in 30 years. And we're basically gonna see things like this, I think for, for a while, which is that coronavirus, may have already triggered a US housing market crash. We're gonna see that and it's gonna actually create it when the media talks about it, people actually think it. And it's gonna create some kind of downward trend in the market for some period of time. I don't know how deep. I don't think this is gonna be um, as bad as 2008 because that was artificially inflated. I was in the mortgage business. So that was artificially inflated by um, ability of people to buy uh, you know, 20 properties and put no money down. That's not what's going on now, but the truth is that this is a cyclical business and the cycle has been up for a long time. And I think we're due for somewhat of a down cycle, somewhat of a correction. Okay, so as the way that I can help you, we'll get to it after, but we have a presenter today, right? 10 minutes in. His name is Steve Moskowitz. So he was he, he is the head of business development and partnerships at Dominion Capital RD Advisors. So they are a family office lender uh, that's lent really in the Boston area until now, and now they're coming to Long Island. Um, he is a very uh, smart guy. Obviously, he's got a JD from Emory, MBA, MBA from YU. He worked at Schulte, Roth, and Zabel. He did merchant banking at, Gold, at Morgan Stanley. And I don't want to steal his thunder and take away what he's going to say, but just to give you an idea, you know, when I spoke to Steve about what his products are, he's basically told me, you know, it's similar to other people. Um, but when I really got into it, I found that he, he, his products are a little different because 10 years ago and, and earlier, when you had a hard money loan, Hard money loans really were asset-based loans. They really didn't care that much about the borrowers. You were buying the property cheap enough, they would lend you money on it. But over the last 10 years, it's really morphed more into uh, a combination of underwriting borrowers and the property. So if people wanted to do their first loan, a lot of lenders won't lend to you. And if people had bad credit, a lot of lenders won't lend to you. But this company uh, is more of an asset-based lender. If the deal is good uh, and it makes sense, they will do it. So Steve is going to talk about what they're doing and their products. So Steve, I'm going to unmute you now. Or are you unmuted already? No, I think you're unmuted. Can you talk? I just, yeah, I muted myself. Thank you so much, Michael, for the great introduction. Just tell me when to go to the next slide. Sure. Yeah. So Michael, thank you again for this opportunity. And nice to meet everybody today. Um, <clears throat> so as Michael mentioned, um, started out my career as a corporate lawyer. Um, left the dark side, went over to the business side about 10 years ago and have worked on alternative assets over the last 10 years across private equity and real estate, um, both in uh, capital formation, capital markets roles, as well as deal origination roles. 
and about two years ago um, started at Dominion Capital, which is a single family office based in Manhattan. Um, we invest across asset classes, but are primarily opportunistic lenders. Um, real estate lending being one of our areas of focus. RD Advisors is a joint venture between Dominion Capital um, and a, a gentleman named Sean Kelly Rand, who's based in Boston. Sorry, I think I screwed that up. Sorry. Uh oh. Am I <laughs> okay. Michael, you really did steal my thunder. I'm sorry. I apologize. Let me, uh, let me, all right. So I, you may not be able to see him, but I'm going to present so you can see the, the tabs. Sorry. We can see him now. Can you okay, hear me? Yeah, well, I think it, all right. Better you see what he's trying to tell you. So let me know when to go to the next uh, slide. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so 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 our RD advisors is a, is a is a is a joint venture with Dominion Capital. So um, I guess a, a few things to note. Um, one is um, yeah, obviously over the last several months, it's been an incredibly difficult environment for everybody. And one of our strengths that I always told borrowers was that you should always be careful about where your lenders are um, getting their liquidity from. And as many of you have probably seen in the market, there's been a plethora of lenders that have entered over the last couple of years um, that sort of say that they're direct lenders, but really only have, you know, a few million dollars on their balance sheet and are primarily um, sourcing their liquidity from selling their, their loans on the secondary market. There's a huge secondary market that exists for these loans. A lot of lenders are selling their loans to um, firms such as Rock Capital, um, which then go into CLOs and package for pension funds and insurance companies, which buy these high yielding debt. Um, so the issue with that is that over the last several months, um, a lot of lenders that were relying upon that secondary market effectively stopped, stopped funding their construction draws. Um, some of them have actually shut down altogether. Whereas our firm, because we, we had a very strong balance sheet, never relied on the secondary markets for our liquidity. Um, we're, we're in a, a strong position over the last several months um, to continue to make loans. Um, so so that's that's a little bit on our, so RD Advisors is, is structured as a closed end private debt fund. Um, and we focus on the one to four unit um, fix and flip space. We provide loans for rehabs as well as refis um, some ground up construction and as well as commercial small balance. So on the commercial side, historically we've done multifamily, uh, mixed use, uh, industrial, um, post COVID we're staying away from retail and, and hotels, uh, but still continuing to land on the commercial side as well as the residential side. Um, you can kind of go to the next slide. So as I was saying, you know, kind of standard hard money lender in the sense that we focus on acquisition and rehab loans, refis and ground up developments. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So, um, you know, in, in terms of the kinds of properties, um, single family homes, condos, multifamily properties up to four units on the residential side. Um, spoke a little bit to the commercial in terms of loan size, um, 200,000 um, is the smallest size loan that we make on the residential side, up to 20 million on the commercial side. So we're focused on smaller commercial deals. Um, as everybody's probably seen, there's been a change in both pricing as well as leverage over the last couple of months. Pre-COVID, we were, you know, 9% lenders one to three points over the last couple of months. We're really, we've been in the 10 to 12% range. Um, leverage has also come down. So whereas pre COVID, we were getting up to 90% of the loan to cost and hundred percent of the rehab uh, over the last couple of months, um, we've really only been as high as 80%. So that's leverage kind of come down across the board. Um, so we typically lend, um, borrowers are typically bringing approximately 20% or 25% of the purchase price. Uh, we're funding 100% of the rehab, and we close in uh, under 10 days. Um, and in terms of the um, what Michael was saying, we are true honey, hard money lenders in the sense that um, we are a lot more interested in the quality of the asset 
and the entire deal is driven by that ARV calculation. So we perform substantial analysis on the um, after repair value by doing uh, comp analysis. And we also have software to analyze that. And then everything from everything from the ARV drives the amount of money that we're willing to lend. Um, and, you know, we do not uh, have a FICO score requirement. So as I was kind of saying before, a lot of the lenders that were selling their loans uh, on the secondary market, those uh, participants have FICO score requirements and borrower experience requirements amongst other things. And we, we, because we don't do that, we, we've never had a FICO requirement. We've never had a minimum experience requirement. So we're able to work with newer, lend, newer borrowers, um, which I think is something that really separates us. Um, you, you can go to the next slide. So, yeah, I mean, I've talked a little bit about what I think our competitive edges and what separates us from other other folks in the market. I think you're going to get speed, hopefully, from most hard money lenders. The difference between a hard money lender and a bank is a bank usually takes 45 to 60 days to close, whereas a good hard money lender should be able to close in seven to 10 days. Um, some people care about our experience. We all come from Wall Street backgrounds. Michael alluded to in my background. Um, any, everybody on our team has worked at a large Wall Street bank. Um, and we have the expertise in real estate uh, as well as lending. Um, Dominion has been in, in business for over 10 years. Um, we are very flexible in our loan structures. We're able to cross collateralize assets um, and work with borrowers to accomplish their goals. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of high level about uh, RD advisors. Um, and we are now focused on, we, we have made loans historically in New York and the five boroughs, uh, but we're now focusing more on Nassau County and Suffolk County, um, and as well as Westchester. Um, as, as everybody knows, there are trends of people obviously moving outside the city due to COVID. So we're just seeing a tremendous amount of activity in these areas. Um, so I um, feel very lucky to have the opportunity to present today and um, looking forward to being of service to uh, the members of this chapter going forward. Um, and if you need to contact me, um, my email address is steven at domcapllc.com. Um, my phone number is listed as well. So please feel free to reach out to me um, with any questions you have. We're actually, we're pretty informal. If you get a deal in, all you have to do is send us the address, the purchase price, rehab amount, and the projected ARV. Um, we'll take a look at it. And if we like the deal, we'll get you a term sheet within 24 hours. So um, it's a fairly, fairly easy process, um, but happy to answer any questions. If anyone has any questions for Steve, just uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Hey, hey Steve. Uh, my name is Corey. How are you doing today? Hey, Corey. Nice to meet you. So, you don't require a, a minimum FICO score experience. So, what are you what are you basically looking for, and how do you get the, the you know how do you get it up to eighty percent? Eighty percent is what on the fix and flip on the purchase. Yeah, the purchase. Right. So we're funding a hundred. So what are you look? What are you looking for? What are you basically looking for in a borrower? Well, we're looking for the borrower to have a budget that makes sense. So we do review the budget ourselves, and we have people in house that have a background in construction. So we go through the budget pretty thoroughly. Um, we also look to the comps to make sure that the property has sufficient value and there's a uh, there's a sufficient um, ROI for the borrower. So we want to make sure there's a spread there between uh, what the borrower is spending on the purchase tab and what they could sell it. And then we're looking at the liquidity of the area and the market to make sure that comfortable with the amount of days the properties typically sit on the market. So a couple of things to note is we purposely stay under the jumbo limit. So we're not usually in any mansions or properties, the $800,000 mark in New York because of liquidity. So we're sticking to the, that, that, that we are most liquid in the most liquid markets. Um, so that's kind of really what we're what we're looking for. If a borrower comes to other without experience and it's got rehab, we're really going to be some just sort of look for people in the project to guidance um, on a day to day basis. So if it's a very complex, project, there might be with a newer. If it's a like rehab. Um, or another kind of project, and we don't really focus on experience. And, and you said that you're going to be focusing in New York now. You, is Boston? What states are you focus? Have you focused on in the past? Just Boston, or, or there's other states? Most of 
locations have been in Boston in the five boroughs of New York, done deals in Bronx, Queens, um, and Brooklyn. Um, we haven't done deals yet in Nassau County, Suffolk, and Westchester, which is where we want to start focusing a lot of our time now. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Any other questions? Someone has a question in chat. Tamara asks on fix the list, there's no money down. No, Tamara, you're saying you got to put twenty, at least 20% down plus close the cost or maybe more, which is pretty standard right now in the industry. It's uh, well, pre-COVID, it was 10% down, and now it's pretty much across the board, at least 20% down. Some, I heard some places are going to 15% down. Maybe, maybe Steve will go to there eventually, but I don't think they're there right now. Yeah, the rates, the rates are changing constantly. Um, I think hopefully by the fall, assuming New York is still in a good place and the real estate capital markets are still in a good place, we think that the leverage uh, will potentially go back up to pre-COVID levels. Let's see what happens there. I would say that the biggest gating factor for us really usually is borrower liquidity. So a lot of times people come to us with a deal um, and they don't have any money. So um, you know, we can refer them to people that provide gap funding. We're even thinking about starting to get to JV equity ourselves. We can actually start, um, you know, participating on the equity side with borrowers. We think would be a huge, you know, boon to the business. But for now, we're just senior secured lenders. We have done some of this, um, but yeah, it's the biggest gating factor for borrowers usually is, is not sufficient liquidity. So you do have to have either enough cash on your own balance sheet um, or investors that are supporting you. Yeah, Corey asked the question in chat. Um, are you doing portfolio loans, he asks, Steve. Yes. Yep, we can cross collateralize assets. We can do blanket loans across multiple assets as well. And what, that's actually a way for us to um, improve the overall leverage is to be able to cross collateralize assets, which allows borrowers to actually bring less um, equity to the table. So we've, we've done that with borrowers who have less equity, and we can do that with properties that aren't encumbered by mortgages. So if you have other properties there that, that are, don't have mortgages on them, then we can cross collateralize properties. Joanna asks, do you, you allow lenders to go in a second lien position behind you? Yes, we can have lenders in second lien position, yes. Okay, and Daniel is asking, can you go more into gap funding? Daniel, sure. Sure, okay. Yeah, so um, it, it's basically a fancy term for, um, you know, if we require a, a, a borrower to put in 25% of the purchase price, so if the purchase price is $100,000, um, we're requiring the borrower to put in 25, but they only have 15 and they need 10, 10 is the gap. So really the fancy term for um, the equity that's left over. Um, and that can come from a variety of sources. And we have seen so many borrowers that um, have great projects and don't have enough equity that we've started to um, consider developing a, a JV equity program. Um, and the way that, that usually works is, um, whereas with a hard money loan, lenders might charge 10 to 12%, um, maybe 9%, I guess, pre-COVID um, on the on the equity position. Um, typically, lenders will charge 8% on the equity. Um, so, and then they'll provide that gap funding. But there's also other companies um, in the New York area, I know that provide unsecured loans and other kinds of um, gap funding for for you know borrowers looking to do fix and flips. Interesting. I don't even know the work of people that did that unsecured loans, but uh, we'll talk about that after the presentation. All right. Any other questions for Steve? All right, Steve. Anybody needs him? Um, I'll put his contact information in the notes. I'll just type it in so everybody has it now. Uh, I mean, it's on the screen, but you'll have it then too. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And Michael, thanks again for letting me present. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I think what you're doing is interesting because it's just, it's just not around that much. Just so many people are, uh, are you know, underwriting the borrower more than underwriting the property, like you said. Um, okay, so Steve's uh, contact information is in there. I'm going to go back to my uh, presentation. Okay, so if people need help, there's seven ways that I can help you if anybody's interested. Um, the first is I can help you get a list. If you need a list of prospects, uh, I can get you really low prices. You can get my pricing from, um, from listability. So I used to 
tell people to get uh, a list source. List source is good and it's a drop cheaper than listability, but I've been, I did some research during COVID because I had a lot of time. And I think the data listability is a little better. So it's worth it for an extra 100 bucks, 200 bucks on a list that you're going to use for six months to a year. Um, it's worth it to use listability. If you need a link, I can give you a link. And it makes listability much easier to use. The, the two reasons why I used to tell people not to use listability is because their, their interface is difficult. And they used to be a little more expensive. But now I give you a link where you basically put in the information you want. You send it out, and somebody gets a list for you. Um, also, I can get probate leads. I love most of the surrogates courts are not open yet. But as soon as the surrogates courts open, I can get you probate leads at ridiculously low prices. Um, if you, so I always tell people you should get licensed so you have access, uh, be a licensed real, real estate salesperson or broker, so you have access to multiple listing service, which is the best data for you to comp out properties. But if you can't do that, there is something second best. I used to not, I used to, PropStream is a really good software system that I used to not recommend because they weren't great in New York, but they've improved significantly. So I can get you, a, I think I'm the only person in the world that can get you a discount on PropStream. If you want to get it, I can give you a link. It's $97 a month, but if you keep it for three months, I give you back like $9, so it's 10% off. Um, PropStream is really good. It's not as good as multiple listing service, but it's close. So if you need to comp out properties, and people come to me all the time that they want to start, doing this. And I say, how are you going to comp out properties? And they tell me they're going to get it from Truly or Zillow. And it's just not effective. That is not a good way to comp out properties. When I comp out properties, I look at every single property three ways. So I have two properties. I went on two appointments this morning. I got to look at the property. I'm going to look at three things when I look at, at in my multiple listing service. I'm going to look at what the ARV is. So what are fully renovated properties in that area selling for now? I also then look back at what the investors paid, but that's usually six to 12 months before. So that's number one, what's the ARV? Number two is I look at what are investors paying right now? So I look at what um, REOs, which are bank owned properties and short sales are going for. So I can get an idea of what investors are paying right now. And the third thing is I look at what are junky properties going for. So if I may be able to pay more if I wholetail it, so I can buy it and then just do minimal work to it as long as it's financeable. So those are things that you can only get via the multiple listing service MLS or from PropStream because you need to really see the pictures and get into these properties and look in a very, very small geographic area to get an idea of what's right and what's wrong. So if you're interested in PropStream, let me know. I also have amazing tier one skip trace data. It's eight cents a hit. So if you send a list of 10,000 in and only 8,000 get phone numbers, you only pay for 8,000 and eight cents, which is ridiculously cheap. It's uh, The data is so good, it even gives you a call window for every single day of the week, a two hour window when that uh, phone is more likely to be answered. Um, I have virtual assistants that have some capacity. Like I said, I have people who are not really uh, working that much. Um, if you're interested um, uh, for four hours a day or eight hours a day, I can give you people. They're not that expensive. Um, they're already trained. Um, and I can get a great CRM if you're interested. I use RE Simply uh, also at a discount. And I have a course that teaches if you're interested in learning. So this is a home-based virtual course. I never thought I would make a course, but during COVID, I had a lot of time and people asked for it. It's a nine module course. It's like a 90 to 120 minute webinar for each of the modules. The standard price of the course is 847. It's going up soon. About 60 people have signed up for the course already and taken it. I've gotten very good feedback. If you sign up in July, you can use this code, this code, RIA COVID 25 off for 25% off the price. This coupon code will end in July. It's already, the, I, I offered bigger discounts before and this course will never be offered at this price again. I'm putting a link for the course if you want to take a look. Um, how to flip New York.com slash course. If you want to see it, if you don't, it's fine. Um, so that is the course. These are the nine modules of the course. The first one is mindset, really how to think, first of all, for success. And second of all, how to think about real estate. I know I didn't think about real estate right when I first started, and that definitely uh, cost me a lot of money. The second module is all about what's different in New York, what's good in New York, what's bad in New York. There are a lot of challenges in New York, but there are a second definitely advantages in New York. The third are choices you need to make before you start, things you have to think about. Do you want to rehab? Do you want to wholesale? Where do you want to operate? The fourth is really important. It's all about marketing and getting leads. The fifth is about sales conversion, making offers and getting contracts. The sixth is funding your deals if you need money for them. The seventh is about rehabbing and wholesaling, so doing construction and coming up with estimates. The eighth is all about finding buyers, both cash buyers for wholesale deals and end user buyers if you're rehabbing or wholesaling. And the ninth is all about closing, uh, what you should do, what you can expect. And then there's a bonus module. People ask for some additional data on things. That is the course. Our next meeting, right, we're doing twice a month. So our next meeting will be 
um, July 22nd from 4 to 5.30 p.m. It's not looking like we're going to be re- meeting in person that soon. So we'll have another one. It's two weeks from this Thursday. Um, I'm going to see if we can get another presenter. If not, I'll talk about a topic. Uh, for some free resources, if anybody wants, you have my YouTube channel, which is called Wholesaling and Flipping in New York. I really give away a lot of content, so you can subscribe and watch it. Um, I post I post it every day this week except today, uh, and I'll post tomorrow, so four times a week. I think I'm going to be going live on Facebook four times a week and then putting it on my YouTube channel. You can like my Facebook page, which is LMPK Properties, or my personal page, which is Michael Pinter. You get updates on what I'm working on, all the deals I'm doing. Um, it's free. Cha- so I'm part of a mastermind with John Martinez and Mike Hambright, and another hundred guys that do business all over the country. John Martinez, I think, is the premier sales trainer for real estate investors. His uh, his uh, website is MidwestRev.com. He gives away a tremendous amount of information. Also, everything he teaches is counterintuitive. It's not what you think when you're sitting in front of a seller. The way you have to talk to the seller and what you say and how that seller reacts is not really what you think. Um, and then there's a Flip Nerd co- podcast with Mike Hamburg. I think he's done 1,500 of them or 1,600 of them. He's done them for five years. He posts a, a, a podcast every single day. There are people who have built their whole business based on that. They're not in New York. He's in Texas. Um, but you can learn a lot from those resources. So if you haven't already signed up for the Meetup group, you please join the Meetup group. It's meetup.com slash nasa-county-ria. You can get updates and information about future meetings. Okay. So now it is question and answer. You can ask anything. It doesn't have to be about what we what we just spoke about. Um, all I'm asking is that you do it one at a time. If you have any questions, please ask them now. And it is 4:33, so we're right on time. Any questions? No questions. Nobody has any questions. Again, there's no bad questions. You can't ask. A- Michael, when the Mike, Michael, do you know when the court when the courthouses are know. opening for the auctions? I don't know. I mean, I, I thought they'd be open already. I thought it was going to be in this phase, phase four, but um, it hasn't happened yet. It may happen soon, but I'm not sure. I really, I'm, I'm looking for the surrogates court to open on a few deals because I need letters of testamentary. I have two deals that I'm trying to sell that are uh, like estates, and the title company won't close unless there are updated letters of testamentary. It just shows who the heirs are, and. Um, I'm still waiting. One of, actually, one of them I just got uh, for Suffolk. We ordered it online. So I'm hoping the courts open soon. I also want to get probate leads of people that want them and can't get them when the courts are closed. So I hope very soon, Corey. Any other questions? Again, there are no bad questions. You can't be too basic. I know a lot of people that are on this thing may have basic questions. I, I am fine with answering them. There are no, no bad questions. Don't feel bad asking something that you think might have been covered if you came late or seems too too simple. Anybody anybody have any questions? Nobody's unmuting. You can put it in chat if you're embarrassed to speak. You can type in your question also, I'll answer it. Um, oh I have a I have a uh, it's a testimonial there from Alfredo Lopez that took my course and he liked it. Um, any other questions? You can ask a question about the course. You can ask a question about what's going on in the market. You can ask a question about hard money lending. You can ask a question about anything that I do. Any questions at all? Type them or speak them. I'll give a few minutes. If nobody's going to ask, I'm I'm fine getting back to my deleting my crap in my CRM. I, I screwed up my my uh, setting and I got a lot of leads that aren't there. Corey asks, is anyone and whenever heard of Connected Investors, is it a good site? So I'm actually a member of Connected Investors. I don't think it's a good site. I think it's crap, but um, but it's a network that's they're trying to build. I think it's big in other areas, Corey. I don't think it's so big in New York. But can't hurt. It's free. So I joined it. I post things on there. All right, we got a question from XM. What advice would you give someone interested in investing with as little capital? So this is what I tell everyone. Um, in order to, it depends really what you want to do, right? If you want to rehab, it's going to be very tough to do that with little capital. You're going to need some money to rehab. If you just want to wholesale, then you need about between somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. You got to save it up if you have to. You need to buy a list, and I can help you get that list at a discount. And then you need to skip trace that list, and I can get you that at a discount. It'll cost again. If people have done it somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars, and what that gets you is a list of somewhere between eight to ten thousand people with phone numbers that are likely to sell for whatever reason, it's gonna be a broad list. So let's say it's people that are older, it might be people that uh, have owned the house a long time, it might be people that are under 
financial distress. And then you got to call them or text them. I mean, it's calling and texting is free. So you're, you, if your marketing budget is zero, this is a way to do it, but you need to invest a little bit into just a list and, and, uh, and skip tracing the list. So you have phone numbers. That is what I would say. Again, you're going to need about a thousand to $1,500 to start. You don't need anything else after that. You just, and I, you need some way to capture the data, but you can use a free Google sheet. But if you want, uh, even more specific step-by-step uh, -step advice, I can give it to you. You can contact me uh, off, uh, offline. I'm gonna put my phone number for my office. If anybody wants to call me, and then I'm gonna get to the other questions. Uh, anybody can call me at that number. I'm not saying you're gonna get me, but I'll call you back certainly within a day. Okay, Ellie Aviel says, where would you just start looking for joint venture partners? Ellie, I don't know what kind of joint venture partners you want. What do you want the other partner to do? You got to be more specific. Put that in the chat. Michael Keys, when you do a wholesale deal and you buy using the standard Mayo formula, what's the formula for selling at 80%? I'm not sure what you're asking, but my general wholesale numbers in New York in general, and obviously this is not, um, it's not a hard, a hard guideline, but I look to buy properties at 70% of ARV minus repairs. And then I look to sell that to a rehabber at 80% of ARV minus repairs. It's my general rule. It doesn't always work. Sometimes I end up not getting outbid by someone else, and sometimes I can't find anybody to buy it. But I, if I'm buying close to 70% of ARV minus repairs, then I know that I should have three options on it, depending on the area and depending on the thing. I, the best deals I do are deals where I can either wholesale them at the price I buy them. If I can't, then maybe I can hotel the property, do minimal work to it. If I can't sell it there, then I can just do rehab to it and sell it at that price. Ellie, you're saying fix and flip joint venture partners, but I don't know what you're saying. Are you? What are you doing? Are you bringing money and you want somebody else to bring you a deal? Are you bringing deals and you want them to do, like you got, Ellie, you got to be more specific. If you want unmute and we can have a conversation. Michael, yes, that's the inspiration I'm looking for. So that's my general rule. Again, you know, I used to, when I when I was when I was gut rehabbing everything for the first four years, I didn't use any Mayo rule at all. I basically, I mostly bought capes in Elmont and Valley Stream. I knew if I paid around 270 or 280 for them and they weren't complete knockdowns, I could fix them for 40 or 50 grand and sell them for about 400 grand. That was my formula. Very, very, I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer. I got a degree in engineering and that was my formula. So that's pretty pathetic. Um, but once I started going direct to seller, I needed some kind of formula. So that was my general formula. I got that from Brad Chandler, a guy who does a lot of business in the DC area. And he's like, buy it at 70% minus repairs, sell it at 80% minus repairs, you, you'll find people. And it's true. So, so, But again, those are estimates, right? So your ARV, so, uh, somebody could have a lower or higher ARV and your estimate repair, somebody else could have a different one. You just need one guy who's gonna pay you enough to make money. I average $30,000 on every on, on my wholesale deals and my hotel deals, around 30,000. I, I make more on my rehabs, but uh, they take forever and they cause me more, more grief. So um, Joanna says, how many minimum buyers should you have on a buyer's list in order to sign a contract quickly? That's not a good question, Joanna. I'll tell you why. You only need one, right? You just need one that's going to buy it. So uh, do not work. I, I, for, I, I cannot tell you how strongly I feel that anybody that's in this business that's working on building a buyer's list without a deal is wasting their time. Every minute you spend building a buyer's list is a waste of your time. And I'll tell you that for a bunch of reasons. Let me just list them off. Number one, you don't know what a the difference between a buyer and a bullshitter is. 99% of the people you're going to tell that you're going to speak to and say, I have great deals. Do you want to buy them? Are going to tell you yes. And most of them are full of shit. Half of them are going to be wholesalers anyway. So you, you want to believe it and you want to think you're building a buyer's list, but you don't know if they're real buyers or not. That's number one. Number two, once you have a deal, that's when you start working on your buyers list and you look for people in that area who have bought. So you know they're not bullshit just because they bought. Now, they may be one-off guys who are not going to buy again. They may be guys who bought and lost money and are not going to buy from you or buy from anyone. They may be, but at least you know there's something real there. So you got I go to MLS and I look for people. Okay, the idea that you can reverse wholesale by finding buyers and asking them what they want I tried that. It doesn't work, right? You'll speak. You'll. I. So my buyers list, I'll tell you, is around 800 people. But I, I probably haven't sold deals to more than 50 of them, right? So most of them are full of shit, and you cannot spend time. Any time you spend building a buyers list before you have a deal, in my opinion, is time flushed down the toilet, and that is the only real currency we all have is time. 
Do not spend time building a buyer's list. The whole business, this whole business is finding discounted deals that you can lock up. That is it. If you can do that, you will never be broke. If you spend all day building a buyer's list, you will be broke because you have nothing to sell them and you don't even know if it's a real buyer's list. Do not. When I For four years, I went to the auction every single Tuesday in Nassau, right? I spent 40% of my week on that. What I did is I took extremely detailed notes on every single property that sold, who it sold to and how much it sold to. I thought when I was going to wholesale, I had the ultimate buyer's list because I had all these guys that I know were buying. When I came to them with deals, they all told me to go screw myself, every one of them. They all felt like if I was coming to them with a deal, something was wrong with the deal. So listen, I'm happy I did it and I can go back to these guys and say what happened with that property and I can look up if these guys made money because sometimes I didn't even understand why they would pay these prices. But guess what? All that time I spent was useless for my wholesaling business. The only way I built a buyer's list is by having deals. The absolute best way to build a buyer's list is to get a vacant property under contract where the seller does not care and put it on MLS, list it, list it for investors only, amazing investor deal and see people who call you. Those are probably gonna be buyers. Some of them may not be, but that's the best way to build your buyers list. Get a deal and you can either put it on MLS or call someone like me and see the people who put in offers. That is gonna be your buyers list. Do not spend any time, not one second on building a buyers list before you have a deal. Okay. Charlie Edwards, what percentage should you have for earnest money when wholesaling? Ha, ah, that's a great question. So if you listen to all the bullshit that's on the internet, you can just put a $50 down on a check, right? That's how it works in North Carolina and Phoenix and Texas. So standard EMD, standard earnest money deposit in New York is 10%. So there's a very, very, very important thing that you must do that I tell everyone. As soon as that seller says yes in New York, you need to plant three seeds that are very important if you want to wholesale. Number one is the size of the deposit. Number two is that the contract has to be assignable because standard contracts in New York are not assignable. And number three is that you want to show the property. So there are very specific language that you should use for the seller. You want to plant those seeds in the seller's mind before he speaks to their attorney, before they speak to their attorney. Because what inevitably is going to happen is that your their attorney is going to prepare a contract send it to your attorney, and that contract is going to A, not be assignable, B, have a 10% deposit on it, and C, have no, no language in the addendum about showing the property. So, Maxine, repeat, please. I don't know. Um, there are three three seeds you need to plant when, you, when a seller says yes before they speak to their attorney. Number one is that the contract is assignable. Number two is the size of the deposit, which is negotiated, but you want to keep it low if you, unless you want to drop a, a large number there. And number three is they have to show the property. So there's very specific language you want to tell the seller that tell that frames it in a way that helps the transaction and helps them. All right, I go through it in more detail. It will take them too long to do it now. But these are things you need to speak to because inevitably the seller's the seller's attorney is going to send the contract to your attorney and it's not going to be assignable. It's going to ask for 10% and it's not going to have any language about showing. And when your attorney sends that contract back to the seller's attorney and says, we need it not assignable. We want to give you $5,000 instead of $30,000 and we want to show the property that seller's attorney is going to tell his client, not every time, but sometimes you shouldn't sell to these guys. They're not real. They're full of shit. That's what happens. So, but if you had that conversation with the seller first, then when the seller tells their client, you know, the guy is asking for all these things, the seller says, oh yeah, we spoke about it. It's fine. It'll work nine times out of 10. It doesn't work every time. And the, the, there's usually a negotiation on how much of the EMD. I mean, to tell you what I tell you, what I tell a seller about a deposit is I say, listen, I'm involved in a lot of transactions, which anybody can say that's not lying. If I put 10% down on every single transaction, I'd probably go out of business. Sellers understand that. So if it's okay with you, I like to put $5,000 down on this transaction. Now, again, the seller might say, okay. And then the seller's attorney might say, don't take 5,000, take 5%, that kind of thing. But it becomes a negotiation. You want to have that conversation with the seller first. So um that is the story with with earnest money it's not a simple thing right and you're in a state where the only state in the entire country where the standard deposit is 10 percent. even in california you go to the bay area and you're buying a property for two million dollars nobody's going to ask you for 10 percent. they might ask you for a hundred thousand dollars but you're buying a property for two hundred thousand dollars they might ask you for four thousand dollars so 
they might ask a three percent you know it, we're the only state that has a lot of issues that need to be dealt with which is why if you're getting your information about how to do this business from anybody else on the internet and there are great people on the internet and they're great companies i love these guys but they could not do a deal in new york to save their lives because they just don't know how it works it's different in new york and you need to get your information from somebody who's doing it in new york and as crazy as this is going to sound there aren't that many people doing it in any systemic way in any systematic way in new york there are very very few very few in long island where i work there's almost three million people in long island i only know three other guys who are doing this in any kind of systemized way okay just to give you a a, a contrast in oklahoma city which i think is a few hundred thousand people I know 12 guys doing it, and it's probably 100. So all these things that make New York more challenging have created a very, very, very good situation if you want to do business here because there's much less competition. So again, these are things I go into in the course. You know, I'm, not, I'm not selling you hard on the course if you don't want to get the course, but there are a lot of things different in New York. All right, any other questions? You see, nobody's unmuted, and I don't have anything in the chat. Ellie, again, if you want to, if you want to elaborate on what – Finding JV partners, I don't really understand the question. I want to know what your partner means. You're, you're bringing something to the table, and the other side is bringing something. If you want to elaborate or if you want to unmute, I'll be happy to talk to you. I see no. Michael, it's John. Hey, John. Hey, so um, I have a, I got a lead, and I called the um, homeowner. I skipped trace. I called the homeowner. Um, she said that her husband died. He owned the property, but she doesn't really want to talk about it. Um, right now, so I offer. I said, "Can I call you back in about a month?" And she said, "Okay." What would you advise as the next steps? Because, like, what, 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 what am I next? What well, should I do said, now? You okay. said it's a lead. If she said she's not, why is it a lead? Just because somebody died? No, because somebody sent it to me. Like, meaning she's open to talking about it, just not right now. Okay, so you should follow up with her every single month and don't forget ever. Okay, and then, but if she, told, call, if she told me to call her in a month, I'd call her in three weeks. Okay. And, is there uh, any action I should be taking in between? There's no action you could take. I mean, listen, I don't consider it a lead until until a seller tells me that they want to sell. Uh, like that, I wouldn't consider a lead. That's a prospect. It might become a lead, but until that lady says, "Yeah, I'm looking to sell," she might she, she may never sell. She might keep that house for 50 years, and uh, she may sell it to our kid. You know, and when she says I'm interested in, in listening to an offer on it, then it's a lead. But you you whatever she says, whenever she says you should contact her, you should contact her sooner than that. So if she says call me in a month, I'd call her in three weeks. If she says call me in four months, I'd call her in three months. I'd always take a little off. And just don't get your hopes up on that because it's not that's that is that's a prospect. That's not a lead yet until she says she wants to sell it. And then you could have a conversation with her and get into why she wants to sell it. Right? That's really where 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 we make our money. Okay. Like what's the story? So she's just thinking about selling it. Like I, I I'm going through old leads now, tons of old leads. There are people who uh, you know, I mean every story is different, but like they, you know, they I, deals that I thought were super hot ended up being horrible people, you know, they just never sold or didn't do it. So you need to have a conversation with her. And then when she says she wants to sell it, get it to why. Right. Okay. And the, just the fact that her husband dies, not a reason why, if she can't afford it, that's the beginning of the reason why, what does that mean? You can't afford it. Like how you want to agitate the pain. Like you want to get into that whole Sandler Martinez system. You want to find out why, and you want to go two or three levels deeper and find out why she wants to sell it. Right. Someone dying is not always a reason to sell. She might she might have made money on the on the life insurance probably. You don't know. So you want to get into why. Why? If she can't afford it, maybe okay. it's got bad memories for her. Maybe every time she goes into the house, she sees her husband. They don't cut crazy things like that. You got but you want to find out why. You want to dig deep into her reason why she's gonna sell. But she hasn't told you she wants to sell yet. So first get get there. Okay. Oh, and fine, but I mean I mean the standard four pillars of 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 motivation from Brent Daniels are now you want to find out what the condition of the house is. You want to find out her time frame when she wants to sell. You want to find out her reason for selling, and then you want to get her price if you can. So that's what you want to do once you, once she says she wants to sell, then you want to get into all four of those. All right. Thanks, Charlie Edwards. You offer mentorship. Yes, Charlie, I do. Call me. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Something I recently started doing. Um, any other questions? coming up on less than an hour i've never stopped this before five i'm fine doing it if you want to but i'll give a few minutes if anybody wants to type in the chat or if anybody wants to unmute and talk i'm fine with it either way hey michael this is andres um are, are there any areas on long island where you 
you know, would stick away from as a first time wholesaler or fix and flipper? Yeah, you want to stay away from any of the really high end areas. So there's a few reasons for that. First of all, it's always harder to wholesale a high end property because usually the people selling them are uh, more savvy and would the concept of selling to an investor would seem very foreign to them. But also now those areas have been hit a little harder. And in general, like I usually put a cap when I'm when I'm uh, or getting a list of things that with market value above seven or eight hundred thousand dollars is an area I don't want to look at. Um, the the better areas to wholesale are always going to be the lower the lower priced areas. That's just a fact. Those are the people who uh, who are going to be more willing to sell at a discount. So you fo- you want to focus you want to focus more on those areas. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? I'll give it a few minutes. Again, I'm I'm definitely going to stay here till five. So we've got eight minutes if anybody wants to talk or wants to chat. I will not punch out before that. If I got nothing, then we'll be pretty quiet for eight minutes. Um, Andres again. We got another sure. one. Um, any suggestions on buying from an investor um, that maybe they're just trying to get out of the game? Is there anything different, um, you know, in those four pillars between a homeowner and an investor? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't, you know, listen, I'm a wholesaler, so I'm selling half my properties as an investor to other people. You got to do the due diligence and figure out what the numbers are, and that's how it works on every single deal. So, um, you know, things that you can look for. I, I, I looked at a property yesterday right near my office in, in Woodmere, and I thought it was a good deal. And in five minutes, um, in five minutes, I saw that the taxes were $29,000 in an area where the taxes are typically $15,000. So it doesn't mean it's a deal you can't buy. It's a deal that you're going to sell for a lot less because someone needs to be able to afford an extra $1,200 a month in taxes and has to look at that and say it's still worth buying. So this is the kind of due diligence you need to do. So like if you're buying in an area that you're buying a property, I'm buying a property now in Freeport that every other investor passed on because they thought it had to be lifted for Sandy. So I did the due diligence, went to the village of Freeport and was told it doesn't have to be lifted. So I'm thrilled. Um, but this is the due diligence you got to do. It doesn't matter where you buy it from. The idea, listen, let me tell you something. All those freaking morons, and there's dozens of them who didn't bu- don't buy my properties, who buy at the auctions are idiots. I know. Like, let me give you an example. I know there was a guy, he's just he's a smart guy. He would buy a cape in like six different cities for $300,000. I went in with the same cape for two eighty, dollars and he wouldn't buy it for him. The guy's an idiot. That's all there is to say. There's another guy who was buying stuff, paying a lot for them, and I know his numbers. I had the same properties. I offered him at a discount, and he could not stomach the fact that I was making money on it. Like he said, I'll only make, I can't have you make more than $10,000. I'm like, I'm selling this to you for $70,000 less than you paid at auction. He's like, I don't care. I can't do it. That's just stupid thinking. I don't know what to tell you. That guy's an idiot. He probably missed out on a dozen deals that he could have made money for me over the years. The other guy's an idiot. He probably missed out on 20 deals he could have made money for me over the years. Don't look at it where it comes from. It's irrelevant. You just have to really do your due diligence so you don't get screwed. So you, this is not a deal that has to be lifted. This is not a property that has to be lifted. This is not a property that's got crazy taxes. You know, you got to just do your due diligence, but you got to be okay. Uh, it doesn't matter where it comes from. All right, there's some chat questions. Richard asks, you would not avoid places like Hempstead Roosevelt. So I got to tell you, so for the my first four years, five years, I avoided those places, and I was a complete moron because I could have made a fortune more in Hempstead and Roosevelt. I could tell you the hottest places in Nassau right now are Roosevelt, Freeport, the lower income areas. Do not avoid those places. Do not. For so many reasons, they're they're great. That's the areas where you can make the most money. XM asks, looking to buy out of state, are there any states that are considered hot or emerging rental markets? Looking to buy and rent, by the way. You know, there are states that are easy to do business. Texas, Florida, both Carolinas are easy to do business. Georgia, there's a million states that are easy. Nevada, um, Arizona, those are all good. But if you're looking to buy and rent, just be prepared. It's hard. It's not so easy to manage property from far away. That's it. But the best, Texas is the easiest state to do business with, especially if you're going to be a landlord. If a guy doesn't pay his rent to Texas 45 days, the sheriff comes and kicks him out. It's amazing. Not like here. Um, 
Florida is also pretty good. Those are easy, easy states, big states. I mean, listen, Texas is the, Texas is the second biggest state in the country with 30 million people. Florida is the third biggest state with 21 million people. New York's the fourth biggest state with like almost 20 million people. Those are good states to work in. You know, if you want to buy out of state. Any other questions? You can unmute. The five hundred um, dollar earnest money, like. I'm sorry. Five hundred earnest money is that like even possible? Because it's very possible in uh, North Carolina, Arizona, and in all forty nine states except New York. If you come to a seller's attorney with a five hundred dollar uh, deposit, that seller's attorney is not going to make a write up a contract for you. Just doesn't work in New York. Like I said, standard is ten percent. If you're buying something for three hundred thousand dollars, they're going to ask you for thirty grand. You can negotiate it down a few thousand. I, I know there are people who put that up, but if if they have a seller's attorney who's preparing their contract, and ninety nine out of a hundred of them do, that guy's not going to do it because he's going to think you're going to walk away from the deal if the, if uh, if you if you want that sellers, the fact that a seller's attorney prepares the contract changes a lot of the deal. The main thing it does is it makes a seller's attorney who's usually charging between two and three thousand um, dollars feel like he doesn't want to waste his precious time on a deal that's not going to close. So, can you convince people to take five hundred? You could try. I've I've never been able to. So, that's my thought on that. It, it, my, it works in other states. It's very hard to make it work in New York. Because even if the seller, even if the seller agrees to it, his attorney may tell him that's crazy. So I know attorneys who did, who wouldn't let me put less than. I want to put ten thousand dollars down on a deal. He told me we're not budging unless I put twenty thousand dollars down on like a twenty five thousand dollar deal. Maxine, what else? So, so in New York, you always have to have an attorney to close the deals. Is that what you're? Um... In New York, the seller's attorney prepares the contract. If you've been told, and I'm sure you have by many people, that you can bring a contract to a seller appointment and push it across the table with a check for $50, that's not going to work in New York. In New York, once a seller says yes, he needs to engage an attorney to repair the contract. And I have closed deals where the seller didn't have an attorney. They were not so much fun because the seller's attorney does certain things in the process that everyone is expecting them to do. Um, but that's how it works in New York. The seller's attorney prepares the contract, sends it to your attorney. Then you find the buyer for it, and he has an attorney. And if that buyer has a lender, then there's a lender's attorney. So it's not uncommon on a wholesale closing for there to be four attorneys there, which is crazy, but that's how it works. Anybody else? We're definitely staying on for another minute, and I'll answer questions till 5.30 if you want. But... uh I don't see anything in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute, now is your time. Nothing. I'll give it another 30 seconds, and then you got to hold your peace until two weeks from now, or you can just call me if you want. But that is your right. Somebody, Alan says, I'll email you. Good. Richard says, this is great. First re meeting, looking forward to the next one. Well, welcome, Richard. Charlie says, how do you get, one second, I missed that one. How do you get an attorney to represent your deal? Well, you have to you have, you have to pay them when it closes. I mean, you need an attorney. That's just the way it works. You can't close, you cannot do any real estate business in New York without being represented. And you need an attorney, if you want a wholesale, who knows how to assign contracts. And I can tell you that 99 out of 100 have no idea how to assign contracts. They know about the concept because they learned about it in law school, but they've never done it. So I recommend it. I have a great attorney. His name is Robert Wisnicki. He has offices in Queens and in New York. I'll send you his number. I'll put his information in. He's great. Uh, uh, 018-419-1764. But contact him if you actually have a deal. Don't ask him about theoretical stuff. He's busy working on my deals and does a lot of deals. He does, I don't know. I mean, he has three attorneys in his office and a bunch of paralegals. They probably do 20 to 40 closings a week. So don't. Ask him bullshit. You can ask me bullshit. I'm fine with that, but don't bother him. I'm going to put his information here. Art at w -R -E .com. He's good. He knows how to assign. He's great. Uh, I'll give it another 30 seconds. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm punching out. We're after 5. I'll stay to 5.30 if there's any questions to ask that need to be answered. But 
If you have no questions, I'm ready to go. OC, first time here. Welcome, OC. A lot of gems have been dropped. I appreciate the presentation. Everyone has questions. OC, it is my pleasure. Again, if you want to call me in the office and if you need any help with anything, I'm here to help. But I think that's it. Anybody else? Any chat or any unmuting? I will give it another minute. Anything? At 502, I'm out of here unless somebody talks. Anything else? All right, I think we're good for the day. Steve, thank you very much for presenting. If anybody needs to reach Steve, his information is in the chat. If you don't have it, you can contact me. I have his number. Um, Charlie, call me. I put my phone number before. I'll put it again. Uh, Charlie, you can call me from my office. Number. Wow, I really bad typer. Number 516-209-2010. All right. Charlie, you can call me. and We'll talk about it. I guess we're done here. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And we will talk. Uh, we'll have another meeting in two weeks from today. Bye-bye, everyone.